night. The trial is set to begin in two weeks. I'm Mark Irons with EWTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and join us this evening for news from a Catholic perspective. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Wade Menezes. In North America, call toll free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Happy Tuesday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. If you'd like to be part of the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. You can always send us an email, openline at EWTN.com, or you can text your question to Father Wade. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Ryan Penny and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our hostess, he is every Tuesday talking faith, family, and fellowship. Father Wade Menezes, Road Warrior, how are you? Doing great, Jack. Today I am in Kansas, in the big metropolis of Kingman. So you can't say, I'm not in Kansas. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore because you are in Kansas. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, um, there's a lot of people, Father Wade, that I know, a lot of people that would really benefit from your springboard topic today. Uh, I'm not one of them, but a lot of people (laughs) would really... benefit from this topic and you're going to uh you're going to talk about detachment and uh and uh, one of your one of father mitch's confreres uh is is going to help us understand that a little better that's right uh detachment you know coming up uh with lent here in just a few weeks with ash wednesday beginning lent um it's good to look at the ascetical life asceticism you know asceticism of course is the spiritual effort or exercise in the pursuit of virtue and to grow in that virtue And the purpose is to grow in Christian perfection. And a big part of that asceticism is detachment. And I love the definition of St. Thomas Aquinas' definition of detachment. He says, detachment is simply loving persons, places, and things the way God intends us to love them. In other words, not to have inordinate attachments, but ordered attachments to persons, places, and things. So in a life of asceticism, detachment regards the withholding of undue affections or inordinate affections for creatures for the sake of the Creator. And whenever mortal sin is involved, detachment is imperative for salvation. Father John Harden teaches that. Uh, Detachment from creatures um, that are an obstacle to complete service of God is a normal condition for growth in holiness and the spiritual life. And so in each person, each person's vocation to holiness, detachment is that virtue which frees an individual from any inordinate attachment to another person, object, or state of mind. True detachment is not simply a lack of care for the thing, but rather it is a liberation from any excessive affection that would hinder one's love and worship of God and neighbor. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas defines detachment as loving persons, places, and things in the way that God intends us to love them, as I just said. And it involves the affections then, huh? Because we're to to have ordinate affections rather than inordinate affections towards creatures, namely nouns, persons, places, and things, I like to say. And the term affections, as used in the spiritual life, uh, refers to emotions, that is, passions or feelings. And all three of those terms are used synonymously, uh, emotions, passions, and feelings. Feelings. And dispositions following from a response of love or desire or delight to what is a perceived good. 
Uh, such responses of the human heart also include revulsion in contact with evil and rejection of whatever is disordered and tainted with evil. For example, one may have a preference for what is pleasant, such as uh, overeating, but through the asceticism of a reasonable diet, one can come to delight more in healthy food than in disordered eating. Someone may prefer watching television uh, to going to Mass on Sunday, but through growth and appreciating God's gifts, he may come to love the Eucharist more than trivial amusements like watching television, uh, training the affections or the heart to respond in an ordered way to true values is a basic part uh, or growth uh, of growth in virtue, and that's important. And then there's a, there's a passage here from St. Ignatius of Loyola, the great Jesuit founder. You mentioned Father Mitch's confer earlier, and, and I mentioned Father John Harden as well, who was also a Jesuit. Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola teaches us about detachment the following, quote, God freely created us to know so that we might know, love, and serve him in this life so as to be forever happy with him in the next. God's purpose in creating us is to draw forth from us a response of love and service here on earth so that we may attain our goal of everlasting happiness with him in heaven. All the things in this world, that is, all created goods, are gifts of God, created for us to be the means by which we can come to know him better, love him more surely, and serve him more faithfully so as to attain the beatific vision, eternal beatitude, and the vision of God forever. As a result of this truth, we ought to appreciate and use these gifts of God insofar as they help us toward our goal of loving service and union with him, as well as love of neighbor. But insofar as any created things hinder our progress toward this ultimate goal, we ought to let them go. In everyday life, then, we should keep ourselves indifferent or undecided in the face of all created goods, that is, created goods themselves, again, persons, places, or things. When we have an option toward them and we do not have the clarity of what would be a better choice, we need to be very, very careful. We ought not to be led merely by our natural likes or dislikes, even in matters such as health or sickness, wealth or poverty, between living in the East or in the West, becoming an accountant or a lawyer, or any such of these uh, choices set before us. Rather, our only desire and our only one choice should be that option which better leads us to the goal for which God created us, heaven for all eternity. Now, he gives us natural gifts, so one might be called uh, in mind and heart to pursue studies in accounting and to becoming an accountant, and that's a great thing. So we want to look at things like gifts, but such things should not uh, become our demigod as it is. Huh? And so in short, I want to say this. Uh, we want to we love things the way God intends us to love them. And so I end with this. It's, it's called Eight Things That God Will Not Ask You on Judgment Day. Huh? I thought this was very good. Number one, God won't ask what kind of car you drove. He'll ask you instead how many people you drove who didn't have transportation of their own. God won't ask the square footage of your home on Judgment Day. He'll ask you instead how many people you welcomed into your home. God won't ask about the designer label clothes you had in your closet. He'll ask how many people you helped to clothe. God won't ask what your highest salary was. He'll ask you if you ever compromised your character to obtain that salary. Number five, God won't ask you what your job title was. He'll ask you if you performed your job honestly, ethically, and to the best of your ability. God won't ask how many friends you had. He'll ask instead how many people to whom you were a friend. Huh? God won't ask in what neighborhood you lived. He'll ask you how you treated your neighbors. And number eight, God won't ask you about the color of your skin. He'll ask you instead about the content of your character and if you respected the dignity of every human person from conception until natural death. Huh? So eight things God won't ask you on Judgment Day and eight things we could add that he will ask, knowing that he doesn't want us to be uh, uh, attached inordinately to creatures, persons, places, and things, but rather to have an ordinate attachment to them, persons, places, and things, that those things through an ordered attachment may lead us uh, properly to him. So detachment is really ordered attachment, huh? And notice that in an authentic sense then, 
Uh, detachment protects us from establishing inordinate attachments to persons, places, or things. And so this theological definition of detachment does not negate the existence of love. In fact, detachment is precisely about loving things appropriately. None of this negates love that I just talked about. It actually helps prosper authentic love. Huh? In other words, self-indulgence and compulsive behaviors are not expressions of authentic human freedom or love. And we are deceived if we believe they are. Galatians 5.13 says, My brothers and sisters, remember that you have been called to live in freedom, but not a freedom that gives free reign to the flesh. And Psalm 7 says that we are called to not be consumed with malice. Here is one who is pregnant with malice, it says. He conceives evil and brings forth lies. No, not at all. So we don't want any malice in our choice of love, no ignorance in our choice of love, no weakness in our choice of love. Sins of malice stem from the will, sins of ignorance reside in the intellect and that the intellect's not informed, and sins of weakness stem from the passions, emotions, or feelings not properly ordered. The wisdom of the Jesuits, the Dominicans, delivered by a father of mercy only on EWTN's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. Hey, this is Michael O'Neill, the Miracle Hunter. I'll be delving into the fascinating world of miracles and taking you on a hunt that explores the greatest mysteries and marvels of the Catholic Church. I'll be examining what constitutes a miracle, how miracles are investigated and approved, and the role they play in the lives of the faithful. We'll look at the miracles of the Gospels in early Christianity, considering the claims of the miraculous in our own modern age. The Miracle Hunter, Saturday at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Mike and Alicia Hernan with the Messy Family Minute. St. John Paul II tells us that family is the school of virtue, but for many parents, it feels like a school of warfare. Siblings, no matter what the age, tend to have conflicts with each other over an endless number of issues. We're here to tell you, first of all, even though it feels like your children will never get along, they can be best friends someday. The fighting doesn't last forever, but you will need to be proactive in developing strong ties between siblings. First of all, give them the tools they need to resolve conflict. That means teaching them how to listen to others, how to ask forgiveness, and how to take responsibility for their own actions. Second, resist rushing in to solve every conflict for them. They need to learn how to figure things out for themselves. And last, keep perspective. These children will be in relationship with each other for a long time. And if they aren't getting along when they are four or six, don't lose heart. They will have years to figure it out with your guidance. For more resources and ideas on resolve a conflict with kids, visit us at Messy Family Minute. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, shortly after the inception of EWTN Publishing, one of the first projects that they undertook was taking the mini-books uh, that were written by Mother Angelica many years ago that uh, back in the 70s that the sisters used to print themselves, and they would sell these to provide their sustenance or part of their sustenance uh, here at the monastery. And uh, one of the first things that I said that EWTN Publishing did is they gathered together those mini books and they took three or four of the mini books of a, of a similar topic and they put them into small little hardback bound volumes by topic. They came up with seven of those volumes and uh, eat uh, the um, and that's available now for you at EWTN's religious catalog in a beautiful uh, cardboard decorative box. Uh, all seven volumes are located there. Uh, things on, you know, prayer, suffering, um, Christ and Our Lady, uh, all sorts of topics. It's, a, it's, it's visually beautiful and it is spiritually enriching. So I uh, encourage you to check it out now. A special boxed set, The w Spiritual Wisdom of Mother Angelica. Um, you can uh, check all of that out at EWTNRC.com. Free standard shipping always on online orders of $75 or more. That's EWTNRC.com. If you'd like to be on the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986.
Um, uh, Jasmine Father Wade is watching us on YouTube uh, from Scotland, and she says, "Can you explain the difference between the ministerial priesthood and baptismal priesthood?" Sure, wonderful question. Yeah, ministerial priesthood, Jasmine, is one of the seven sacraments. It's the sacrament of holy orders, along with diaconate and episcopate. We have the presbyterate of the priesthood, so it, it's it's part of the sacrament of holy orders, where the baptismal priesthood, also known as the common priesthood of all the faithful, uh, is not a sacrament per se, the, the baptismal priesthood, but it's tied to the gateway sacrament that we call baptism. The reason why we call baptism the so-called gateway sacrament is because it's the one that's ordinarily received first before the other six can be received. So baptism is known as the gateway sacrament. And the common priesthood of all the baptized or the, the baptismal priesthood is tied to the sacrament of baptism. And we all share, according to those two degrees of ministerial priesthood and baptismal priesthood, in Christ's threefold office as priest, prophet, and king. We are we are called to this service tied to Christ's own divine uh, kingship uh, as priest and prophet and king, but each one in a different way. So the, the two priesthoods are different, but they work together. This is why at the words of offertory at the Sacred Liturgy, the celebration of the Holy Mass, uh, you hear these words during the offertory of the bread and wine, and I say bread and wine because at this point in the Mass, the consecration has not yet taken place. We hear the celebrant say, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Uh, the priest says to the laity in the pews gathered as a congregation, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice, in other words, my primary intention for this Mass, may, and yours, and your intentions that you've brought to this Mass, laity, Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Well, who can offer a sacrifice but a priest? Now, the two priesthoods are different in kind. I want to make that clear. One's a sacrament, one is not, okay? One ontologically changes the other. The other one is part of baptism, which ontologically changes the other, okay? The person who receives baptism and the person who receives priesthood are both ontologically changed. This is why baptism and priesthood are not uh, repeated sacraments, because of the indelible character or spiritual seal they put on the soul, never ever to be erased, along with confirmation, Okay, they're never to be received a second time or third time or fourth time. They're only received once, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. Uh, but they work together, these two priesthoods. And, uh, and so in your baptismal priesthood, you, you come to Mass with a particular willed intention that you wish to offer at that particular Mass, united with the priest celebrant's primary intention. And you're able to make that offering in your baptismal priesthood. This is one of the reasons why we want to come to Mass a few minutes early, to recollect ourselves in the pew before Mass actually begins, with the intro at antiphon, for example, or the entrance antiphon, or the, or the, re, the processional hymn. We want to uh, have those moments of silence before Mass actually begins to make that particular willed intention. So great question, Jasmine, and thank you so much for listening all the way from Scotland. A couple of open phone lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. First up today is David in Peoria, Illinois, listening to EWTN on St. Bernadette Radio, a first-time caller. David, you are on with Father Wade. Hello, Father Wade. Hello, David. Thank you for your call from Peoria, Illinois today. Uh, I was wondering, were more angels faithful to God, or did more of them sin? You know, that's a great question, and we just don't know the answer to that. We have the virtue of hope, one of the three theological virtues, that the greater number of angels stayed faithful to God. Okay, so it's just not revealed in Scripture uh, how many uh, were created to begin with, how many fell, or how many remain faithful, we just don't know. We know that through church teaching, we divide the choirs uh, of angels into nine different choirs according to what Scripture tells us about the angels. Uh, but St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that, that each 
uh, angel is really its own uh, Janus and species precisely because they're bodiless, okay? They don't fall into a Janus, so each one must be its own Janus and thus its own species precisely because they're bodiless spirits. So that's quite phenomenal when you stop and think about that. But we do know that, that they're classified in choirs and there's nine of them, but we don't, and we know that those in the choirs are faithful, remain faithful to God. We don't know how many they are, only, only how many choirs they're divided into, and we don't know how many fell. But we know that the ones who fell are indeed the devils and the demons that tempt today. Okay, so great question. Great question. Thank you so much. Father Wade, question for you. Does the sacred scripture in the book of Revelation, where it says that the tail of the dragon swept away a third of the stars, give us any uh, insight into this question? You know, uh, the church fathers say that that sweeping away of the stars could actually refer to the princes of the church, the bishops of the church. Uh, others say that it's, it's uh, allegorical to the angels that fell, uh, but there's no uh, official church teaching on that. Again, uh, primarily because of the, the four senses of Scripture, the literal and then the spiritual sense of Scripture, and the spiritual having its three subsets of allegorical, moral, and anagogical. So we just don't know. There's no official church teaching on that. There's only interpretation from the church fathers on that, and that is one of the interpretations. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833 833- Two eight eight three nine eight six. Linda is in Rockwood, Ontario, Canada. A first time caller listening on the Amazon Echo. Linda, you're on with Father Wade. Uh, hi, hi, Father Wade. How are you today? Doing great, thank you, Linda. Um, my question was: with all the information that we find today on the internet, uh, whatsoever. Um, my question was: how do you go about? consecrating your home and your family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? Beautiful question. Yeah, Beautiful hold on, question. Father Wade. Let me get my pen out here so I can take notes. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah, you, and, you and Johnette will be doing this hopefully uh, soon, as soon after the blessing of the house, which just was a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, you know, if you, if you were to Google enthronement of the Sacred Heart, you're going to find uh, a lot of different sites to go to. They may or may not mention the Immaculate Heart enthronement as an option. Therefore, I would recommend going to the website of the religious order Alliance of the Two Hearts. It's www.ath-stl.org, Alliance of the Two Hearts. And it's a religious order uh, founded by Father Bing, and they have at their website the materials for the consecration and the enthronement of the two hearts in the home. And it's precisely because that's a religious order of priests, brothers, sisters, as well as laity, kind of like third order members, that belong to this group. It's a very varied religious order. It's called Alliance of the Two Hearts, precisely because they're founded on the two hearts. They are a fantastic resource to get the materials you need for the enthronement. That's what I would recommend. Alliance of the Two Hearts. Thanks so much, Linda. We appreciate that phone call. That frees up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Next up is Christina in Dallas, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Christina, you're on with Father Wade. Hello. Yes, I um, was listening to your intro comments, and you're talking about how to live an ordered life, a temperate life, mm-hmm. and I really caught the phrase about the the will being tied to the passions, and I'm having a, a difficult situation for myself. Um, my mother and my mother-in-law both have dementia, and during this pandemic, they moved in with us, and my mother was very abusive to all of her children from an early age, age two or three. And so um, now that she's from, she has dementia, she's a very nice person. But every time she touches me, I become rigid. I just don't even think about it. I, you know, and so I, I don't, I have a hard time showing her affection. I'm kind. I always speak kindly to her. I try to take care of all her needs. But that physical affection, I just can't seem to do it. And I was wondering if you had any advice of how I can get past this obstacle. 
Great question. And Christina, you broke up just a little bit. Is this your mother you're talking about? And if so, is it your natural yes. blood mother? Yes, it is my natural blood okay. mother. Okay. I would, I would take some serious introspection through prayer and maybe even through uh, uh, a session or two of spiritual direction with a priest or maybe a good Catholic psychologist, one who practices the sacraments, who knows the faith very, very well. Sometimes you might find a parish with a Catholic psychologist uh, on staff who's a member of that parish, and their way of tithing to their parish is to offer a certain number of hours uh, at the parish per week uh, to give spiritual direction. Remember, a confessor has to be a priest, but uh, a, a spiritual director does not have to be a priest. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So either a couple of sessions with a spiritual director or a couple of sessions with a, a Catholic psychologist who practices the faith, who understands the beauty of the sacramental life, the whole economy of salvation, living one's baptism, one's confirmation, sustained by regular Eucharist and penance, really striving for that asceticism, that growth in virtue, etc., and try to get to the root cause. It's probably some type of childhood wounds, or wound um, in regards to your relationship with your mother. It could even be something that you're not fully understanding now as an adult that goes back to how you were raised that's causing this kind of um, a recoiling that you state. But I would start there uh, and also develop a relationship with the Blessed Mother, our Blessed Virgin Mother, by praying the rosary, for example, and draw closer to her to lead you in your own relationship with your own mother. God bless you, Christina. It's EWTN's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. The Venerable Fulton John Sheen. It is a self-evident principle that the Creator has endowed man with certain unalienable rights. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. And now... The EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me, our EWTN Family Prayer. Today we pray for those who are lonely. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and love you. You call us friends and your friends we wish to be. Console those who are lonely by making known to them your presence. Let the love of your sacred heart give them consolation. Bring into their lives good friends who will help them to grow in holiness. Show them how to be a good friend to those who are in need. Make them rich in charity, ready to serve others. Amen. Want the latest pro-life news? Want it delivered? Sign up. It's free. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your source for everything happening now in the fight to protect the sanctity of human life. New episodes delivered every week to your inbox. So if you really want to know, sign up today. Go to EWTN.com forward slash pro-life today. Tomorrow on More to Life, the weight of expectations. Feeling burdened by the expectations other people or yourself put on you will help you lighten your load. That's tomorrow on More to Life. Now, back to Open Line. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Plenty of time for your phone calls at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 288 Three nine eight six. Uh, we are talking faith, family, and fellowship as we do every Tuesday. I'm giving you unfettered access to a Father of Mercy right here on Open Line. Next up is Patty in Olympia, Washington, a first time caller listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Patty, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Hi, Father. Hello, Patty. Thank you for your call today. So I have a 13-year-old son who is celebrating uh, his first his sacrament of confirmation in about three weeks, and um, I feel like something significant is changing in my role, um, and I'm wondering if you have some general advice for me 
for particular prayers or what actions or what shifts should I make. Um, I'm putting him in the hands of the Lord, and it feels great, but I don't really know what I'm to do next. Okay, so for yourself, you're asking uh, more than to advise him further. It's, it's how to make yourself grow, is that correct? In the process of teaching your son to receive the sacrament of confirmation in all of its fullness, uh, you're asking more about yourself, is that correct? No, I think it's a combination, primarily okay. about him, okay. but then how am I supporting that? Okay, now, first of all, about him. His class at the parish could be using this text, but if they're not, get this text. It's excellent, okay? It's an older catechetical text. It's the Baltimore Catechism, and it is just fantastic on all seven sacraments. In simple layman's terms, for the 13-year-old mind, preparing for the sacrament in around eighth grade, it sounds like, your son, uh, it's just an excellent text where he will be able to grasp uh, clearly what it is the church teaches, not only on the sacrament of confirmation, but uh, for all seven sacraments as he wants to grow in each one even more, okay? Sacrament of confirmation should make us appreciate even more the gift of the Holy Eucharist, which he received around age seven, because um, it's now having received the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit that they can grow with more fervent reception of the Eucharist. So each sacrament feeds off the others, right? So uh, you, you want him to understand all seven sacraments, but at this particular time in his life, especially the sacrament of confirmation. But then he'll be able to, re, to, to return to the Baltimore Catechism to look at each of the other sacraments, especially Eucharist and Confession, which are the only two of the seven that can be received over and over and over again. And that little Baltimore Catechism will be very rich for him. Again, simple layman's terms, eighth grade, it, it'll be perfect for him. There's also a little text called The Handy Little Guide to the Holy Spirit by Michelle Jones Schroeder, S-C-H-O-R-O-E-D-E-R. Again, S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R, Michelle Jones Schroeder, the handy little guide to the Holy Spirit. That's very, very good. That it's something for his age bracket that he will greatly benefit from. Um, I would also recommend the Novena to the Holy Spirit. There are several out there. If you go to novenas.com, excuse me, Novena in the non-plural, just the singular, novena.com. It's a Catholic website with some wonderful, wonderful novenas to the Holy Spirit. Uh, I would look at them if I were you as his mom. I would get one that's not too ethereal, one that's not too heady, one that's more down to earth, print it out, and offer to pray it with him. Uh, and I would invite his father, if there's a father in his life, um, you didn't say one way or the other whether, it, whether or not there is, if there is a father in his life, invite his father to join with him in the, con in the confirmation and uh, novena to the Holy Spirit, the novena to the Holy Spirit in preparation for his confirmation. Let him know that his parents are partaking in this novena with him. It can mean a lot to him. Encourage him, even if the class is not doing it, encourage him to choose a patron saint. Uh, for his confirmation. Uh, some parishes don't do that. I, I don't know why. We seem to have gotten by, gone by the wayside, that practice, but it's a very strong staple practice in Catholic spirituality to pick a particular patron saint as a confirmation patron saint and to add that name to their, to their life. Uh, for example, when I made my vows at the Fathers of Mercy and I profess my vows publicly, each time during the four times, four annual years that I made my vows, uh, with my fourth annual being my perpetual vows with the Fathers of Mercy, I said my name aloud, Wade Lewis Jude Menezes, because uh, I chose the, the Apostle Jude as my confirmation name. In fact, all of my brothers did, and my, uh, my one sister chose the name Judith, and she didn't spell it J-U-D-I-T-H, she spelled it J-U-D-E-T-H, because she wanted the Apostle's full name in the name of Judith. Um, my, my mother had a particular devotion to St. Jude, and so all five of us kids in eighth grade, when we received confirmation around age 13 as well, like your son, all chose the name Jude. Uh, and, and I made that a part of my life, right? So when I professed my vows publicly, I wanted, I wanted Jude in there. Uh, teach your son the same, uh, you know, maybe his marriage certificate he wants to include if he gets married. He wants to include uh, his confirmation name. It should become a part of our life. Celebrate the patron saint's feast day in your life. Uh, not only your baptismal name, but also your, your confirmation name. And for yourself, I would like to recommend a great, great book by Kevin Vost, V-O-S-T. Uh, it's titled, The Seven Gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
every spiritual warrior's guide to God's invincible gifts. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, every spiritual warrior's guide to God's invincible gifts by Kevin Vost, V-O-S-T. Um, Great, great Catholic author. And the last thing I want to recommend that you do with your son is write down the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, and the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit. And next to each one, have your son write down how he wants that gift or that fruit manifested in his life. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. And then the fruits of the Holy Spirit, charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. How does he wish to have those seven gifts and 12 fruits manifested in life, in his life? So there's so much you can do for him and his father can do for him, God willing, and there's so much that you can do for yourself as a parent to help him to continue to grow. But I'm a big advocate of the Baltimore Catechism. I'm a big advocate of novenas. I'm a big advocate of choosing a name of a patron saint. Is his confirmation class having him choose a patron saint? They've invited him to, and we've talked about it, but he hasn't landed on one, and it's not a requirement. So I fear he's going to try and slip out from underneath that. I, I remind him being father. Or, yeah, go ahead. Remind him that his being that he's being confirmed in 2021, which is the official year of Saint Joseph, called for by Pope Francis. Yes. Maybe he wants to choose yes. Joseph if if his first name is already Joseph, then then look to another name, but but encourage him. Tell him Father Wade recommended St. Joseph. St. Joseph has 25 titles in Thank his litany, you. and I love the second to the last title of his litany, Terror of Demons. St. Joseph is the terror of demons because he was the guardian of the Redeemer, and the devils didn't have a chance to get to Joseph when he died because he was flanked on either side of his deathbed by his foster son, Jesus Christ, and his spouse, the Blessed Mother. And uh, when the angel appeared to him to successfully flee to Egypt to escape Herod's army, which was ordered by Herod to kill all the male children two years of age and younger because he felt threatened by this newborn child that he thought was going to usurp him from his throne, and he sent out his army to, to, to conduct the massacre of the innocents, uh, Joseph did just that. He successfully fled to Egypt with the Christ child and with his mother. And so that's why we call him the terror of demons. God bless you, and thank you so much for your call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. We head next to the Republic of Texas. Laura is in Dallas, a first-time caller listening on Guadalupe Radio. Laura, you are on with Father Wade Menezes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Father, and to all of my fellow EWTN listeners. Um, I'm happy to say that my confirmation saint is St. Anne. I like it. To piggyback on the previous caller. Great. Um, but I had a question uh, about uh, the type or types of wood that were used uh, in the cross, the making of the cross that crucified our Lord. Um, I understand um, from a friend of mine that it is somewhere in Scripture, but um, any information that you can use to educate us on that, I would uh, really appreciate. Thank you. Sure. Sure. There, there's no official church teaching on this, okay? We know that the Eastern churches and the Western church, the Latin Rite, have their own traditions in that regard. Uh, there could have been elements of different woods. For, for example, according to the sacred tradition of the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, the true cross was made of three different types of wood, uh, cedar, pine, and cypress, because of the cross beams and the different types of wood for the different cross beams. Uh, the stronger tradition in the Latin church, the Western church, is, is uh, cypress or pine or even olive wood. Uh, the point of the nail had olive wood fragments on it uh, in the, the ancient tradition of the holy nails, indicating that our Lord was crucified on a cross made of olive wood or on an olive tree. Um, additionally, a, a piece of Achaia wood uh, was located uh, between the, the bones and the head of the nail, tradition says, uh, presumably to keep the condemned from, from freeing uh, the foot uh, sliding over it in the nail. This, is, uh, this isn't of Christ. This is of, of the ancient practice of crucifixion of criminals. So, um, you know, there was an abundance of olive wood in the Holy Land. We know that. 
uh, in the very area where Christ was crucified. Uh, there was nearby was the Mount of Olives. We know that as well. Those are historical facts. So some of those are some of the traditions that come out of both East and West in regards to the different types of wood uh, used uh, for the crucifixion of, of criminals in general and of Christ in particular. Uh, so great question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free telephone number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. We head next to Cleveland, Ohio. Nancy is in Cleveland listening on the Amazon Echo. Nancy, you're on with Father Wade Menezes. Thank you, Father Wade. Um, I appreciate you answering this question. I was taking a walk in my neighborhood um, a few weeks ago, and in the front yard of someone's home was a very tall pole, and on top of it was this figure, and it looked like um, a gargoyle, but the face was like um, Dracula. There was some other um, things on it, like there was, it looked like a baby in swaddling clothes just below, and it said R.I.P., what I'm um, concerned about, I'm, I'm actually afraid to take a walk in that direction and walk by that person's home. I'm afraid, um, you know, I kind of walked up to it, and I don't know, I was afraid of there could be an evil presence in the home, and I'm carrying my rosary along with me, so I, you know, I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm going to be a target. So I was wondering if anybody um, has heard about this kind of um figure and these symbols, um, yeah. and then yeah. what do you suggest, Father? Yeah, well, the way you describe it, I'm going to use the word uh, or phrase totem pole because of the way you describe it in regards to its heights and the different images as you go up the pole or go down the pole. I have no idea. I have no idea. Is it something occultic of occultic origin that indeed the homeowner is practicing or follows? I have no idea. Uh, it, it's hard to to, to state. I, it would be imprudent for me to, to call it, because I just don't know. Uh, the fact that it has a, a, an image of a baby in swaddling clothes with R.I.P., uh, is it something of, of, uh, of, a, of a pagan origin that somehow is, is married to Christianity at the time of Christmas having just passed with the R.I.P., uh, looking to, the, to, the, to the, the infancy of Christ who later died for us? Who knows? It could be tied to... Uh, uh, other other spiritualities of other cultures, uh, just one example, uh, Native American culture, maybe not. I, I have no idea. Uh, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. That neighborhood of yours uh, with the sidewalks and the streets belong to you just as much as anybody else. And maybe what that family needs or that individual needs is precisely for you to be walking by on the public part of the sidewalk that's meant for all the residents in the area. Uh, to be praying the rosary as you walk by. Uh, maybe one day God will, will bl bless the occasion where they're out in their yard working, and, and you can stop and, and extend a gracious hello and say, uh, I, I've, I've noticed, you know, I, I, walk and I, I walk and pray the rosary in the neighborhood, and I've noticed your t totem pole. I was wondering if you could explain that to me. I find it fascinating, which is the truth, and not necessarily fascinating in a good sense, more of fascination in a, in, a, in a troubled sense, but you don't need to say that. You can just say, I do find it fascinating, and uh, it, the imagery on it I find fascinating. And you will already have stated that you, you, you're, you pray the rosary in the neighborhood, so they'll know where you're coming from. And, and if they want to share, they, they'll share. If, if, they, if they're kind of standoffish and don't want to share, just you know, continue walking and wish them a good day and, and offer the next decade of your rosary for them. Uh, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. And, and you, wanna, you want to be able to, to share your faith and live your faith in different ways that are appropriate given the different, different situation. And in this particular situation, you'd be praying your rosary in a, in, in, while you're getting your walk in and your exercise in. And it's a chance to evangelize and to hear from another. Um, so, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, and I think that's important in a situation like this, that that's your neighborhood, and you're called to sanctify your neighborhood with your prayer. Pray for the people in your neighborhood. You know, that, that's usually a, a prayer intention that we forget. You know, Open Line Tuesday is about faith, family, and fellowship. Well, the fellowship part is important because I think it's important to pray for our neighborhoods. You know, uh, those saints who had great devotions to the angels remind us that each city has its own guardian angel. 
Uh, each family has its own guardian angel. Each individual has their own guardian angel. Um, so this is important. I think it's safe to say that, that we could have the pious devotion that each neighborhood has its guardian angel. And so this is, the church doesn't teach that de fide, but it's something that I think we can reason to, and, and part of our own piety, asking our own guardian angel to protect us, we pray to the guardian angel of our city, we pray to the guardian angel of our neighborhood, etc. And so remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Great, great question, Nancy. Thank you so much. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. You know, we offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass right here at EWTN Radio at 8 o'clock Eastern Time every morning. And a lot of the local AMFM affiliates around the country have uh, carried that Mass or have Masses from their local areas. If for some reason you can't check out one of those Masses, uh, during this crisis in our culture, uh, we have uh, transformed EWTN Radio Classics into EWTN Radio Essentials, and we're offering the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass every two hours on Radio Essentials from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. So if you want to uh, just duck over for a minute, catch the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, and then get back to your local affiliate, uh, it's available for you. Uh, you can find it at EWTN.com or on the EWTN app. Next up is John in Fairfax, Virginia, listening to EWTN on Sirius XM Channel 130. John, you are on with Father Wade Menezes. Father Wade, that was the most amazing segue I've ever heard in my life going, going into the subject of guardian angels, because that's what my question is about. Um, right. How specifically, we're, I've been reading a lot about praying to our guardian angels, and in particular, something that's really piqued my curiosity is that it, I, I've read where it said that I could ask my guardian angel to maybe speak to the guardian angel of, of someone that I love that I'm disenfranchised from right now. And uh, just, just wanted to hear your thoughts on how to add the guardian angel to my regular prayer life. What's the best way to go about doing that? Well, I would begin with the daily prayer to the guardian angel, even the traditional one, angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me near, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule, and to guide. And I have the personal practice each time I get behind the vehicle, the vehicle uh, get in my vehicle behind the wheel, uh, I pray to all the guardian angels of those who will be in their own vehicles around me. So I say it in the, in the first person plural when I get behind the wheel of my truck. I say, Angels of God, our guardians dear, to whom God's love entrusts us all near, ever this day be at our sides, to light, to guard, to rule, and to guide. So I've taken the traditional prayer said in the first person singular, and I simply say it in the first person plural, because I want to include all the drivers around me in their own vehicles. Now, I'm an itinerant missionary preacher. If I'm not flying, I'm driving, and that goes with all my confreres in the Fathers of Mercy. We travel and preach. So I think that's an important prayer. I also like to do periodically a novena to my guardian angel. Again, you can find that at novena.com. You can also find a novena to the angels in general that leads up, for example, to the feast day of the guardian angels or the feast day of the archangels. And that's a third novena you can find at novena.com is to the archangels specifically. So one thing that is not part of Catholic spirituality that's kind of made its way into Catholic spirituality in more recent times is the sending of one's guardian angel to go assist another. Uh, for example, it is said that Padre Pio did that. Now, Opus Angelorum, which is a valid group in the church, they, they advise against that because your guardian angel is meant to be for you. And you, you can pray to another's guardian angel but you don't need to send, in that process, you don't need to send your guardian angel to the person. Keep your guardian angel at your own side. That's very, very important. And Opus Angelorum's um, uh, 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 effort in that and making that known is that that's the stronger tradition in the church. It, that's the stronger tradition. Okay, Padre Pio did it. Well, okay. Uh, he's a canonized saint. We're not. We're striving for sainthood, but we're not. He also... Uh, had divine communication uh, with, with God, something that, that's known through the stigmata and, and, and other things. So uh, he did it. We're not going to question it, but it's not a normative process. There are many things that the saints did that are not normative processes that are part of Catholic spirituality and its patrimony. 
So we want to stick with those that are until God calls us to, to a higher level of communication. We want to stay where we're at and which, what's with the stronger tradition. But it doesn't mean you can't pray to another's guardian angel. It doesn't mean that you can't invoke their guardian angel to protect them. Uh, like, for example, when a child goes off to college, the parents will invoke the guardian angel to protect their child, their adult, ch young adult child. That's a beautiful thing to do. But you don't have to send your guardian angel to go assist the other Keep your own guardian angel by you. That's what's important. So novenas, the daily prayer, the praying of guardian, uh, to others' guardian angels is a beautiful practice. That's very staple in Catholic spirituality, to pray to, 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 pray to another's guardian angel to keep them safe, etc. Uh, like I do, again, in the first person plural of, of the guardian angel prayer when I get behind the wheel. Um, so those are some practices, and I'm, I, I think we, it's important uh, to remember that the guardian angel, the angels, are rational beings. They're rational, non-embodied spirits. The human being, the human person, is a rational, embodied spirit. So we share that with the angels. So the angels know, quote, unquote. They're rational. They're, 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 they, they know things. That they're rational. So if they're rational, just like we are, although they're non-embodied, where we are embodied, it's important to have a relationship with them. It's very, very important, in fact, to have a relationship with the angels precisely because they're rational spirits. And so we want to foster a strong devotion to them and with them, uh, and that's very important to do. So great question. Thank you so much. Next up is Dennis in Grafton, Massachusetts, listening on Emmanuel Radio. Dennis, you are on with Father Wade. Thanks very much. Hi, Father Wade. Hello. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm just, I've been listening to an audio book for... Uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks now, St. Teresa of Avila, and she keeps talking about the faculties of the soul. And I know this comes up in a prayer that I do, um, a consecration to Jesus' Jesus's divine heart. I was just wondering what are, I've been praying it for a while, and it never really struck me till now, but Teresa talks about it like, it, like I should know. So I'm going to ask, <laughs> what, okay. what are the faculties of the soul? The faculties of the soul are uh, namely intellect, will, memory, and imagination. Again, intellect, will, memory, and imagination. And uh, you'll see other lists that might include such things as the ability to freely choose as a faculty of the soul, but that's part of the will. So when you say intellect, will, memory, and imagination, those are the primary four faculties although other lists will have other things listed. Uh, again, the ability to choose, which we would say in Catholic philosophy and theology falls under the, the will itself. The will is what chooses based on a love. If you choose a good, it's based on an ordered love. If, it's, if you choose an evil, it's based on a disordered love, which gets us back to our springboard topic on, on proper detachment of things. Detachment, the virtue of detachment, is really about having ordered attachments as opposed to having disordered attachments. So um, if you email fathersofmercy.com and in the general email and ask them to direct it to Father Wade that you want a prayer of consecration to the most sacred heart of Jesus. Uh, it's a prayer that I've written. It's approved by my superior, most sacred heart of Jesus. I consecrate myself to you anew and to your most sacred heart. I consecrate to you my body with its five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. My soul with all of its faculties, including intellect, will, memory, and imagination, and the ability to choose freely and rightly through the proper use of my will, my entire being without reserve. We want to give these nine gifts, the five bodily senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, and the four faculties of the soul, intellect, will, memory, and imagination, to the most sacred heart of Jesus when we make our consecration to the sacred heart, the same to the immaculate heart, the same to the blessed trinity. Uh, we could say, I consecrate to you all my thoughts, words, and deeds, all my sufferings and labors, all my hopes, consolations, and joys. In particular, I consecrate to you this own poor heart of mine, that it may be united to your own sacred heart, so that I can uh, be faithful to my daily duty and my vocation and state in life. Most sacred heart of Jesus, may I be consumed as a victim in the fire of your divine love. Amen. Email the Fathers of Mercy journal account. Tell them to direct it to Father Wade. Tell them you want the consecration of the sacred heart, and it will be emailed to you. Thank you so much for a great question on the faculties of the soul. 
And if you would like to learn more about the Fathers of Mercy, simply log on to fathersofmercy.com. Father Wade, would you leave us with a blessing? I certainly will. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners and remain with each and every one of you this day and always, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. Pray for us. On behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, producer Michael McCall, call screener Ryan Penny, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with Father Mitch. Until then, God bless. This is Al Cresta. Let Scripture and the truth of the Catholic Church guide you with today's issues. Cresta.